Instead, there be peace and justice. And of course, the answer that Christmas gives us is, you know what? We can't do it ourselves. You don't have to have everything you need to build your dream. You can start small and scale up. I was able to give an incredible gift to my children uh, for them to see faith put into action. We're here inside St. Patrick's Cathedral. This historic New York City landmark first opened its doors in 1879. It's the perfect place to begin our show. First, we want you to know something you didn't know about this special place. The ceiling, that's the secret. Nobody that, looks up, right? Uh, yeah, and, but they all should because it's really, really beautiful. If you want to fully appreciate the magnificence of St. Patrick's Cathedral, you must look up. And the ceiling here, if you look at it, it looks like it could be the bottom of a ship. Right. And it does look like the bottom of a ship. The reason for that about fire is this area is called the nave, uh -huh. and nave means ship. The round rose glass window anchors one end. The vaulted ceiling is made of wood designed to look like marble and stretches the length of a city block. The original idea was that the vaulted ceiling that we have was to be like the vaulted ceiling in cathedrals in, in Europe, made out of stone, made out of marble like the rest of the cathedral. Monsignor Robert Ritchie is the rector of St. Patrick's Cathedral. If you look at the stained glass windows on the first floor, they were put in here in 1878. They've been here since then. They're made by two companies in France, and they tell stories about uh, different saints. St. Patrick has his own stained glass window. The upper part is St. Patrick preaching to the Irish in the very beginning of his ministry. Uh -huh. it, it's red, and I have no idea why it's red. Monsignor Ritchie, who decided at just five years old he would become a Catholic priest, took me to his favorite place. It's a replica of Michelangelo's famous sculpture in St. Peter's. Why is this statue your favorite? Well, because Grandma would bring us here and we would always say a prayer here when we were little kids. It portrays the moment when Jesus' body was taken down from the cross and laid in the arms of his mother for a short time before he was taken away and put in the tomb. If you just look at her face, the sorrow of seeing her son, and that's, this is a dead body. This is not, uh, there's no life in Jesus at all. He just came down from the cross. Millions of visitors from all over the world come to St. Patrick's Cathedral every year. Do you ever find it challenging to really be giving mass in basically a museum. We do everything we can to make sure that people know it's not a museum, it's an active church and we involve people and, and we're very warm and uh, accepting of people, even uh, people who don't share our religion. We make people feel very welcome. One of the more popular exhibits is the crash. The manger scene where Jesus was born uh, and the first Christmas. The Monsignor has it put up early in the season. Because it's the only religious expression of Christmas in this area. Because Fifth Avenue is filled with lights and windows and all sorts of beautiful things, but there's nothing symbolic of, of what the reason for Christmas is. If you look closely next to the traditional donkey, camels, and sheep. And they're all hand carved, they're all made out of wood. Something you might find unusual. This dog here uh -huh. is obviously not the type of a dog that would have been around 2,000 years ago, uh -huh. um, but it looked very much like my own dog. <laughs> so I said, all right, we'll take it. <laughs> St. Patrick's Cathedral is also the seat of the Archdiocese of New York, and the man who occupies that seat is the Archbishop of New York, His Eminence, Timothy Cardinal Dolan. It's one of those only in New York moments. Your eyes are not deceiving you. That is a camel loping across 49th Street in Midtown Manhattan. It's just one of the animals taking part in the Christmas Spectacular show at Radio City Music Hall this year. I would say second only to St. Patrick's Cathedral uh, would be the Radio City Christmas uh, special. On this day, the animals here are getting a very special blessing from His Eminence, Timothy Cardinal Dolan. Oh God, you've done all things wisely. Grant that these animals might remind us of the Christmas story. Cardinal Dolan, who clearly enjoys this annual tradition. You're still chewing that gum from last year? Well, 
<laughs> this is not a carrot, okay? Is blessing the animals who will take part in the live crash during the show reenacting the scene at Jesus Christ's birth. As the leader of nearly three million Catholics in the Archdiocese of New York, Cardinal Dolan every year delivers a Christmas message to people, of course, too. He took time out from this festive occasion to share it with us. We need a little Christmas right this very moment. Now, the mystery of Christmas is it's not just about something that happened 2,000 years ago. It's happening now because God wants his life and his grace and his promise and his hope to be reborn within, you see? That's what it's all about. That's the greatest Christmas present of all. And this year, as the country faces the threat of a nuclear attack, terrorism fears, and a divided Congress, the Cardinal suggests we examine history. At that time of the birth of the Messiah, Jesus, boy, there was, there was a lot of darkness. There was a lot of searching. There were a lot of questions. People were beginning to say, is there any answer here? Is there any focus? Is there any explanation? He says the holiday season is not a time to feel hopeless. In the plan of God, life is stronger than death. Goodness is going to trump evil. And Catholic or not, he says everyone can benefit from his Christmas message. Christmas is not just a memory of an historical fact. It's happening now. We look at the world, we look at Washington, and we're saying nothing seems to be working. Uh, why can't we solve these things? Why can't we get beyond these things? Why can't there be peace and justice? And of course, the answer that Christmas gives us is, you know what? We can't do it ourselves. We need somebody from the outside to help us and save us. And that, of course, is the Savior, all right? The birth of the Son of God. God is saying, keep trying. Don't give up. You can't do it on your own. As we take a look at how New York City is decorating for the holidays, we have a story about one of the most influential preachers in the country. Bishop T.D. Jakes has turned his spiritual message this year into practical advice. I find he's very inspirational. This is an opportunity for me to meet somebody who influences my decisions. It's an honor to have Bishop T.D. Jakes here in New York City. These excited, faithful fans lined up outside the Barnes & Noble bookstore in Midtown to meet their spiritual leader, Bishop T.D. Jakes. Thank you. Yeah, that's Thank so, you so much. much. So Anybody who's been through what you've been through it's survived, you got something to be happy about. Bishop T.D. Jakes is a best-selling author Author, motivational speaker, filmmaker, talk show host, preacher, and entrepreneur. In his new book, Soar, he wants to encourage people to have faith in themselves and their ability to build a secure financial and professional future. He talked about his new book on Good Day New York. The first thing I think you need to do is start projecting where you want to be 10 years from now. Think in decades, not days. And then once you set that pinpoint as to where you want to end up in 10 years, then you want to build all your efforts and the energies around becoming what you're out to do. Themes in his new book, Mirror sermons in his ministry. He advises readers to identify a passion, be practical, make sure the idea is marketable, write down a business plan, be persistent, committed, and more than anything, take action. It's a step-by-step -step narrative to help them accomplish their goals. You don't have to have everything you need to build your dream. You can start small and scale up. He says too many of his faithful remain on the sidelines without taking a risk, one that could improve their lives. It's really to encourage people not to procrastinate, but to go ahead and go after the best of what God has for them and the best of what they've envisioned for themselves in business in particular, but also in life too. Coming up next, afraid, alone, and unable to speak. If they tell me that they're afraid of dying, I might move to some of the other areas in the board. One pastor's mission to change how the sick communicate, and later. Social media is such a powerful force in young people's lives. Finding faith using social media. And now to a story about faith and medicine. A local pastor at a New York City hospital developed an innovative way to communicate with his patients, one that's being copied across the country. I'm too young to die, you know? These pictures show 49-year-old Frank Locastro in the intensive care unit at New York Presbyterian Hospital. Lung disease left him unable to breathe on his own. Frank needed a double lung transplant. 
I felt like I was like a, you know, being buried alive at one point. I mean, is that bad? You know, just sitting there and you know, not being able to move. Waiting for a donor and a match would turn out to be a lengthy and painful process. For nearly two months, Frank connected to a feeding tube was unable to speak. It was tough. It was really tough. Just about this time, Frank met Joel Burning, a chaplain assigned to the ICU at New York Presbyterian Hospital. He's an interfaith, non-denominational pastor. Right after he received his Master of Divinity degree from the Union Theological Seminary, he began his work here. He quickly discovered many of his patients could not speak but desperately wanted to communicate. They're looking right at you and you can see that they're distressed or, or something. They're, just, they're alive. And it was very frustrating not to be able to kind of use this pastoral care that I was taught to provide, not be able to like use the skills I had to be able to help people because they can talk. Chaplain Burning developed an innovative way to reach these patients. He created this spiritual care board. Patients who can't speak can point or blink to indicate the picture that best describes how they're feeling. If someone tells me that they're afraid, and by tell me I mean they point to afraid or have me point to afraid, I can ask them, what are you afraid of? Now they can't talk and tell me, but I could uh, venture some educated guesses. I can ask, you know, a lot of patients in ICU that are afraid are afraid of being in pain. Other areas of the board allow the patient to communicate if they would like to see a priest or a rabbi or just have their hand held. And if they're afraid of dying, what do you tell them? I can't do anything. I mean, I can't um, take that fear away. I'm not a doctor or somebody who could tell them and reassure them, you know, you're not going to die, don't worry. Um, I, don't, I often don't know that, or even if I do, it's not my role to, that's not my job. If they tell me that they're afraid of dying, I might move to some of the other areas in the board. And those include? Well, one of them asks, uh, it's like, like a pain scale from zero to ten, so I might ask them how much spiritual pain they're in. The chaplain really brought his spiritual care board to Frank. And you know, a couple times I was feeling angry. I'd just point to him to tell him how I was feeling emotionally, spiritually, physically, in every other way. Emotionally, he, he was just there for me as a friend. Researchers decided to study the impact the spiritual care board had on patients. Patients reported a 31% decrease in feelings of anxiety after receiving this spiritual care. Now it's being offered to other hospitals around the country. I feel alive when I'm with people in those situations of, you know, crisis and trying to help and, um, and understand them and connect with them. Frank did finally get that double lung transplant. Now he plans on watching his daughter grow up. These lungs are adapting to my body great. I plan on being around a long time. He credits the chaplain and the spiritual care board with helping him get through it. Every day I kept on saying to myself, you know what, I'm going to get these lungs. I'm going to come for me. I'm going to make it. The fact that just a little human connection can make such a big difference. Straight ahead, an emotional reunion. How are you feeling? Great. You look amazing. A family thanks the rabbi who gave their son a second chance at life. Have, you have Rabbi Roth Max in you. <laughs> the story of two strangers now sharing the ultimate bond. And now a remarkable and true story about a rabbi in New Jersey who was asked to inspire others and instead decided to take a close look inside himself. I don't get a hug? Rabbi Larry Rothwax and Donnie Hain are much more than friends now. Good to see you. Welcome. welcome. How's Good everything? Morning. Okay, we're doing okay. How are you feeling? Great. You look amazing. Three years ago, these two didn't even know each other. Donnie's brother reached out to the rabbi. He made a desperate request, asking the rabbi to tell members of Congregation Beth Aaron in Teaneck, New Jersey, that Donnie needed a kidney. It was clear to me, for reasons that I couldn't necessarily articulate, that this is not something that I would ever do. It's not something I could do. I couldn't put myself, my family, my community through the effects of a kidney donation. But yet I was being asked to inspire my community to consider it. It was as the rabbi was preparing for that special service that he came to his own life-changing revelation. As part of the preparation for that sermon in that weekend, I began to do my homework and to research and understand what kidney donation is, what it isn't, what are the risks, short-term, long-term. And much to my surprise, I realized I, that I could not come up with any compelling reason as to why I myself wouldn't want to do this. 
The rabbi turned out to be a match, so he decided to put his faith into action. Each and every one of us in life, at any given point, are in a position to give or to receive. Uh, we all need to give at times, and we all need to receive at times. And there's an entire world that was sort of opened before me, and it was very clear. And uh, this is not a moment that I experience often. It was very clear that I could contribute in a way that would really matter. Donnie's mother says her son was born with <laughs> developmental disabilities and had been leading an independent life until his kidneys started to fail. It was very frightening waiting to see if he, the kidney, the whole operation would go through. The 2015 operation was a success. I thank God every day. A person who donates a kidney to another person is a, truly a hero. As a mom, I always talk to him. I always say to him, you have, you have Rabbi Roth Max in you. <laughs> I now consider him like one of my sons, yeah. you know. <laughs> He's Donnie's brother now, right? Donnie's personalities come back since the right, surgery. Right. I'm going back to work. What do you like to do, Donnie, for fun? Well, I like to, oh, I like to call friends on the phone. For Donnie, life has returned to normal. But for Rabbi Rothwax, life, he says, will never be the same. My life has been enhanced. I was able to give an incredible gift to my children. Uh, for them to see faith put into action. If I could, I would do it again. Next, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. I want them to, to fall in love with what I love. The power of posting and the bishop that's using social media to reach his followers. We all know the power of social media. Even the Pope has 15 million Twitter followers. Well, there is a bishop in Connecticut that has tapped into the power of social media and is using it to try to reach young people. I would make like, pictures with like the caption. Most quotes about the Bible. Oh, quote the Bible. Well, that's a great idea. Bishop Frank Caggiano gets some social media suggestions from Colby Cathedral High School students in Bridgeport, Connecticut. How many are on Instagram? How many are on Snapchat? You might say he's a social media sensation, at least inside the Bridgeport Catholic Diocese. This YouTube video on the Bishop's Facebook page got thousands of views. So I encourage you, my friends, to have a great summer and relax and enjoy it. You deserve it. But please don't take a vacation from our faith. Bishop Frank, as he's known, has Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Snapchat accounts. Social media is such a powerful force in young people's lives that the way they speak, the way they socialize, the way they communicate has been affected by it. Three years ago, the bishop decided to tap into that power. In doing so, he's following the Holy Father's example. Pope Francis has more than 15 million Twitter followers. If our leader in faith is willing to do it, why would we not do it? I want to inform them about the faith, Catholic faith. I want to get them excited. I want them to, to fall in love with what I love. Bishop Frank has helped. He hired a millennial. 25-year-old John Grosso is the Bridgeport Diocese social media leader. We've seen explosive growth on every account that we've launched. Some of Bishop Frank's posts are so popular they've become regular segments like Wednesday Wisdom and Faith Fridays. Bishop Frank provides the content usually before dawn and Grasso does the posting. He decides when and on what platform to put the bishop's spiritual guidance, personal stories and pictures. It's a nice touch for the church to have, you know, like midweek in between Sundays. You know, you see that video on Wednesday and it gets you thinking about prayer or your faith. Bless us, O Lord, for these are gifts which are... Henry Rondon is the principal at Colby Cathedral High School. Any way that we can reach out to the youth of today is an excellent method to try to get them a little more engaged in the church. What the bishop is doing online has Catholic clergy around the country taking notice. Most Catholics are not necessarily coming to church on Sunday. It's extraordinarily valuable. Using social media, the bishop hopes to bring some older Catholics back to the church and encourage younger ones to give faith a chance. His method? To meet Catholics where they are. In fact, where most of us are, online. Our goal is to unite people, not divide people. I think the church has to be a positive force to help young people and young adults be formed in a way that's going to make them healthy, happy, joyful, 
and future leaders of our society and the church. We're back here at St. Patrick's Cathedral. They're preparing for midnight mass and Christmas services. I'm Sharon Crowley. Thanks so much for joining us and Merry Christmas to you and your family and happy holidays.